Well, you're back at the Faculty Factory Podcast, everybody. Hi, I'm Kim Skorupski here at Hopkins, and I'm looking at Dr. Benjamin Kinnear. Hi, Ben. Hey, Kim. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Dr. Benjamin Kinnear is an Associate Professor of MedPeds and the Associate Program Director for the MedPeds Program at the University of Cincinnati, technically Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And we're so excited to have him here because another great example of a colleague, someone like you, who says, hey, Kim, it was our own Dr. Rachel Salas here at Hopkins who said, Kim, oh my gosh, our plenary speaker for the Institute for Excellence in Education, our IEE, Education Conference and Celebration, was this guy, Dr. Benjamin Kinnear. He was awesome. He has this great topic. You need to get him on the Faculty Factory podcast. And I'll tell you the title of his plenary presentation, Humans Are Not Bred, Making the Case for Competency-Based Time-Variable Training. Again, thanks, Ben, so much for being here. We need to hear all about why we are not bred. So please drop some wisdom on us. Sure. And, and first of all, I want to say thank you to Dr. Salas for her sponsorship. I think it's always amazing uh, to have sponsors in your career. And, um, you know, I certainly have so many to be thankful for. Th th that talk actually came out of some work that I did with the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation as part of the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. And to frame it, I kind of want to back up just a little bit for people who aren't deep in the weeds on education. I, I think most people have probably heard of the idea of competency-based education, or some people say CBME. It's kind of turned into a buzz term or a God term that maybe loses meaning at some point. But at its core, competency-based education is just a philosophy of training that orients itself toward outcomes. What are the outcomes of training that we care about? And how do we make sure that those outcomes meet the needs of the patients that we serve, society, and how do we design curricula and assessment systems that make sure that our learners reach those outcomes? That's kind of the core of it. What we've learned over recent years as we've done more empirical studies on the outcomes of training is that, you know, humans are not bred, that we all have our own trajectories to competence. We learn at different speeds, we learn differently in different contexts. And so it starts to kind of beg the question, should we have training approaches and curricula that are so standardized in terms of time and training and what we experience? If you go back to why we do training this way, it's because it's kind of the way it was always done. And it was all about standardizing curricula so that we didn't have people doing things like following barber surgeons or going to proprietary schools. We wanted some sort of standardization. But now that we have empirical evidence that maybe a fully standardized approach is in the right way, Competency-based time variable training is just one iteration of saying, how do we individualize training to what people need? Ben, I love it. And um, note to self, I'll have to guess, apparently break up with my barber surgeon. I mm. didn't realize that that was a thing, um, but I could see how that would have happened. Secondly, I love what you're saying, because at my roots for now, gosh, eight years, I've talked about it a lot of times and and I'm getting... Um, precision a, a piece a what's it called a perspective piece in academic medicine with a colleague of ours Dr. Lisa Bellini at Penn where um I'm talking I'm trying to promote personalized or precision faculty development just like precision medicine and precision education precision faculty development and Lisa and I are working on this opinion piece or perspective piece kind of bringing it back to what you're talking about, Ben, this uh, framework at Penn that they've developed for valuing education and, and putting metrics to, um, to, re to, to reward and acknowledge the work and put, um, just value all the components of education, everything that is education related, the work associated with it, and that the value it brings to the institution. So I thought if I could put precision faculty development in an education, which is the tree trunk of our roots as in academia, right? As faculty members, it's all education. And then build the case for personalizing that based on what just what you're saying, Ben, that each of us, just like our personality profiles we learn or our Clifton Strengths inventory, we all have unique strengths and, and opportunities for growth. We can't have a one size fits all approach for anything. So it, it makes such perfect sense to me. So thank you for doing this and for helping us get the word out about this. And so tell us more. 
Yeah, and I have to say, I've never heard the term precision faculty development. That is fantastic. I I agree with you. There's a big push right now toward precision education, especially led by the AMA and Sanjay Desai. And there's some really cool people doing great work like uh, Jesse Raffel up at NYU and others. And I would say that time variability is just part of that larger umbrella, whether it's faculty development or education. How do we tailor our training and our education to meet people's needs? And um, what makes this work challenging is a couple of different things. First of all, how do you assess what people need? Because that's really hard, right. whether it's faculty development or education. Right. Um, it's always a challenge. And then the second thing is that so many of our programs and our infrastructure and our payment models around things like education and faculty development are based on a time-based curricular approach. Um, if you have a longitudinal faculty development um, program, probably you sign up for 12 months or six months or something like that. And it's presumed that when you finish that, that you have gained the skills that are needed. Um, a more time variable or competency-based approach would say, we should have a way to assess whether you've gained the skills that you came here to get. And it's the same thing for education. How do we know when our medical students, when our residents, when our fellows have gained those skills? And frankly, competency-based time variable training is not just about physician training. This can be applied to nursing, to physical therapy, occupational therapy, any of the health professions that are out there. And frankly, any profession, really. Um, what's interesting is some professions actually kind of do this. Um, I know it's not apples to apples, but in sports, for example, people don't get promoted through the minor leagues and get called up to the big team just based on time served. It's when are you ready? Um, I think we could learn a little bit in terms of how do we restructure our systems to incentivize readiness rather than just time served. Okay, I'm following you. I, I'm loving this. So where are we to date on this? So what is it? What does the now look like? Well, it varies by country. So some countries are ahead of us. In Canada, they've been doing this work for quite some time. University of Toronto really led the way and had been doing it for years. And now at a national level, they are moving toward a competency-based time variable approach. Some other countries that I'm actually less familiar with, but I know they are implementing this on some level, like the Netherlands, uh, have a much more time-flexible, time-variable approach to training. Here in the United States, really, it's just happening in pockets in small pilots because there are so many um, educational and logistical challenges to trying to do time variable training. But I would say some people doing really great work in this area, there's a multi-institutional pilot in pediatrics called EPAC that's been going on for years. And they started uh, a competency-based time variable approach for medical students years ago. And those students uh, then went on to be residents and they had a time variable training approach. And now some of them are graduating. So EPAC has been doing some really great work there are um, programs in plastic surgery, in general surgery. There's a multi-program, multi-specialty program up at Harvard, uh, led by Mary Ellen Goldhamer and Martin Pusick and and John Coe, who are doing some really great work. But all of the, all of these institutions and pilots are kind of wrestling with the same challenges of how do we assess. Uh, to know when people are ready, because if we're going to not use time as a measuring stick, what measuring stick can we use to say you're ready? Uh, and then how do we negotiate trying to do this in a system that is built for using time as a way to say when somebody's ready? And so it's been great to have so many pilots because we're all learning from each other. It's it's a really great community to innovate together. Wow, Ben. Okay, Ben. So I'm putting on uh, my training is as a gerontologist, and I. Often times I'll reflect on this very question that you started off with, the fundamental question, how do we assess what people need? And that was the, like, is one of the fundamental pushbacks I get when I've been talking about precision faculty development since, I don't know, 2017, 18, I presented it in Chicago. And the first question, rightly so, was scale, scale. If if we have over 150,000 faculty members in the United States and at, here at Hopkins, we have, golly, we've got over 5,000 faculty members, you know, 2,000, I'm looking at the numbers here, we've got 3,300 full-time faculty and over, you know, 2,200 part-time faculty, and there's one me 
a senior associate dean for faculty development, how do you possibly scale this up to getting to how are you going to learn if we if Hopkins brings in, say, 200 faculty members every year? How are you going to assess what those faculty members need in terms of faculty development? And go. So now back to my gerontology days is I gave the example, rightly or wrongly, of when people are admitted into nursing homes, long term care facilities, there is back in the day, the minimum data set in MDS is a comprehensive assessment tool. So it would gauge ADLs, activities of daily living, IADLs, you know, depression, social support. I mean, the whole gamut of um, factors. And so that's how do you assess what people need? That's like a tool that would look at the, you know, soup to nuts, A to Z. And then every year thereafter, there'd be an annual checkup, quarterly mini assessments, and upon then any significant life event, like a fall or some other life event that would happen, there would be another assessment opportunity. So I kind of likened it to that process that on onboarding, when faculty are onboarded or learners are onboarded, can we come up with a tool that identifies okay, you're really great at the, you know, coming up a, um, a curriculum or or teaching skills, you're really knocking out of the park. Um, however, we need to like focus more on educational scholarship and getting your publications out in your field. So the same way faculty, or you're really great at um, your clinical work. And now we need to work on you writing a grant or learning how to build a lab. So why is that like what, um, help us understand why this space you're you're working with how do you assess what people need what is the challenge there where are the levels yeah that's a, such a man that's such a great question i think when i think of what do people need i think of it on a couple of levels first is what do we need people to be able to do in the health professions to take care of patients and this is where a lot of large organizations have taken the lead to try to define what are the what are the outcomes of training we care about? Whether it's the ACGME subcompetencies or the entrustable professional activities that uh, we use not only with physician training but also nursing training and pharmacy training, all of these kind of competencies and milestones and EPAs, these are all just ways to try to say how what do we need people to be able to do? And while they're all imperfect and you can quibble with all of them for sure, it at least shows a good faith effort by these organizations to try to think about what do the end users of our system need. And, and most of these organizations are involving representatives of the public and trying to get a broad level of input from people. So even though uh, most of us are not involved in those processes, they are engaging as many stakeholders as they can to, to define what those outcomes are and then iteratively revising them over time if we say, you know what, those weren't quite the right outcomes uh, that we really care about at the end of training. So that's that's kind of the big, big picture. But then the question is, how do you know what some an individual needs in terms of their learning and their trajectory and their development to move toward those outcomes that you've defined. And that is really, really tricky. One of the words we use in education is called programmatic assessment, which basically is a fancy term to mean um, you use multiple different assessment methods in different contexts, hopefully with many different assessors, and you fit it all together in a systematic way that makes sense. So you're not just relying on a single test on a single observation or on a single person, you integrate all these things together to try to paint as good of a picture as you can of what does someone need for their own development. And that I think is a challenge because it, it has to happen at a local level. You have to develop those systems locally to say, how do we assess our local learners to identify where they are in that trajectory toward those, those larger outcomes? Um, this is actually where I think the gap between theory and practice is so important because a lot of competency-based time variable training makes sense in theory. And we are just in the very earliest stages of trying to say, how do we make it, how do we make it work in the real world? And can we actually show the benefits that we're predicting will be there? Same for precision education, precision faculty development, all these things. They make so much sense. And we have empirical evidence that what we're doing now is kind of square peg round hole. But we eventually are going to have to show evidence that, hey, when I tailor somebody's education, when I make it time variable, when I provide this precision education, that it actually helps people meet those goals that we care about. Um, here in Cincinnati, one of the reasons why we decided to pilot time variable training is because we had spent the better part of a decade, actually, working on our assessment system. 
and uh, working on the learning analytics, working on collecting data, working on faculty development to help people understand what we're trying to do with assessment and provide higher quality assessments, and then working on faculty development at the level of our competency committee to say, how do we actually make defensible decisions with all this data? So that was a lot of groundwork that we had to lay just on the assessment piece before we even said, maybe we can start tailoring this more to a time variable approach. Um, so it, it certainly will take a lot of work early on. And hopefully people in the education world anyway, are already doing those things. Because I think faculty development is probably the most important piece to assessment and education and probably the most overlooked piece. Um, there's somebody named Dr. Eric Holmbo, who is at the ACGME. And he often says that uh, the assessor is the instrument of assessment. It's not a form. It's not a framework. All that stuff doesn't work unless you have somebody who understands the task you're asking them to do and they're buying in and they're trained. And none of it works without faculty development and training. And so hopefully people are already doing that work now because it's so important, even if you're not doing this precision education or time variable training approach. This is all so amazing to me. And of course, I've got four questions, but let me back up to the first thing is you talked about like multi trait, multi assessors. And I'm thinking when you mentioned that EPAC group that is now graduating, certainly those graduates, when they start getting in the field, can provide us with a lot of information of, you know, actually upon retrospect, this is what was valuable, this not so much. And um, what I'm finding is this is what I need, but we actually didn't cover. So I think in terms of, of content, and I know this is part of the analytics that you talk about, that that feedback from learners in the actual application, that's getting from, you know, theory to to practice is so valuable. And it reminds me of, I think I heard some podcasts where somebody was bemoaning, you know, just medical training in, in general, undergraduate, undergraduate medical education, where like, why does biological biochemistry have to be the gatekeeper to medicine? I mean, really, how many physicians, if you talk to them right now, use bio biological chemistry in their practice. And probably a lot of them would say not at all. And so we put up these arbitrary competencies and then when they're actually not um, applicable. So maybe I'll pause there because I've got a bunch of other questions for you. Like any thoughts on that rambling little thing about learners themselves giving us feedback? Oh, of course. I, I mean, I think you know, one of my biggest interests, I'm actually doing my PhD in health professions education right now. And the focus of my PhD is on validity argumentation. And when we think about validity in education, we often think about, can you make an argument that the decisions you're making with assessment data are defensible? Uh, that's kind of a very simplified version of how I think about it and how some other people think about it. And I think a big piece of that argument is, what is the impact on our learners? I think they are a big stakeholder in this whole thing. So if we have this theory or this idea that precision education or that time variable training um, are better for learning, maybe more efficient and cost effective for our system, that at least that's there's an idea that's possible someday. Um, eventually, we're going to have to really attend to what do our learners think of this? What is it? You know, did we provide them the training that they needed? We should actually follow them into their careers and say, what are the outcomes of their training? Are they actually delivering high quality care? Um, without that kind of evidence, I think he, people are always going to be skeptical of this approach. And in fact, one of the papers we just published on this pilot uh, focused on the impact to learners and their motivation and their attitude toward growth. And what we found was with the time variable training approach, again, this was our small pilot. It was just a handful of residents many of them really did experience this kind of sense of um, being driven to seek feedback. Uh, they didn't want to coast anymore. It kind of gave them um, a drive to always be improving and seeking mastery. But there were a couple of residents who noted that the idea of being promoted earlier served as a carrot, as a kind of a performance goal rather than a mastery goal. And that was actually maybe detrimental to their kind of growth mindset and mastery learning. So the question we had is, was that something, did that have to do with how we implemented the pilot? And I think there were some things that we did that we could have done better. Or if you implement time variable training and precision education, is it going to highlight 
performance differences between people that will then make people compare themselves to one another and be so focused on performance, just like medical students do when they try to get honors, uh, rather than just focusing on mastery and becoming a great physician. So um, I think that if we don't attend to both the outcomes of training, but also the impact on our learners with all of these things, then we're missing the boat. That's maybe the most important piece. Genius. Yes, absolutely. Tell us when you, you're saying that the term time variable, what does that mean? Um, what is What are the, the parameters, the outer ranges of the, the time variable? How are people the short end and the longest end? What is that looking like? Yeah, great question. Um, so the idea behind time variability is that rather than saying you are going to train for this amount of time or be at this level of training for an amount of time, that it is all based on what you need in your performance. Let me give you an example. In internal medicine, which is where we were piloting it, it's a three-year residency program. Usually you are an intern for the first year. And then for the last two years, you are a senior resident. In this pilot, we said, um, when you come in for your intern year, we're going to be assessing your performance and what, you know, what kind of skills and knowledge you need to develop. And once we think you are ready to be promoted to have lesser supervision and function as a senior resident, we're going to go ahead and do that, even if you haven't been an intern for 12 months. And then even if you haven't been a resident for 36 months or the full three years, uh, if you are ready to practice without supervision, we are going to promote you into situations that kind of emulate that. Now we, because of um, current board certification standards, we were actually not able to graduate people early as part of this pilot, but we tried to simulate that as much as we could. So the idea is that your training period could be shorter or in theory could be longer based on whatever it is that you need. I don't think anybody has any kind of empirical idea of what the guardrails around that would be. C certainly there has to be some sort of limit. You probably shouldn't be an internal medicine resident for 12 years. Um, but there are people who have suggested you might see some variance of about 20 to 30% in terms of training being longer or shorter as kind of the bookends around things. And I think the last thing that this highlights is if we are going to allow for time variability, I do think this would allow people who need more time, the time that they need, people who need less time, allow them to kind of stay at the cusp of their learning rather than just kind of hanging around when they don't need that further development. But we really need compassionate off ramps as part of all of this, because some people, no matter how much time you give them, probably are not going to make it. And one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to make that jump off of the pathway toward being a health professional is that many people incur a huge amount of debt and have a lot invested in that. So if we could develop these compassionate off ramps while we are also working on time variable training and precision education, I think we could go a long way toward wellness toward um, helping develop learners, and frankly, toward helping people kind of seek mastery. Because if you give them more autonomy in their own training, then they're not just going to be on what feels like a conveyor belt towards some predetermined endpoint. Yeah, it's intrinsic motivation. That That's yeah. it's something built, we're building and manufacturing that within them to be constantly exploring, seeking, and having the, the motivation and the reward is internal. And isn't that all what academic academia, I was going to say academic, but academia is, is that exploration and that curiosity. What is a compassionate off-ramp scenario? What is one or like, what does that look like? Um, what have, how have you seen that implemented? So, so a compassionate off-ramp would be something like this. If a medical student comes to a residency program and they are in their first year of residency and they're struggling and, um, maybe struggling mightily and they're undergoing coaching and remediation. And at some point they either, they decide they don't think they really want to do this anymore, or the program decides um, maybe this isn't the right career for you after they've given them every chance that they can. Can we try to mitigate the massive, massive negative consequences of leaving our profession before you get that big payday of becoming an attending physician? Because I don't know about you, I was $250,000 in debt after medical school. And so if somebody were to tell me, um, you can't be a doctor now, oh. and they didn't help me find another career or find me a way to use my degree to try to recoup that debt or subsidize that debt for me, I would have been in big trouble. So I do think we have people who either want to leave the pipeline toward being a health professional or the programs think they just aren't going to make it. 
and we're, we're leaving them out high and dry. And I think we should think of lots of different ways, both financial support, social support, career support to help people make that transition to another field when either they want to or the program says it's ready. Right now, I don't think we do a great job of that. Well, you, you, this whole model is making me, again, through my faculty development hat, when I coach so many faculty members, you know, we don't learn in our graduate, postgraduate fellowships, all of our training, things like we rarely have courses on emotional intelligence and communication and negotiation and building teams and having difficult conversations, all that kind of professional career, career development, personal development happens on the job or if you're so fortunate to have an office of faculty development. And I'm imagining that if we could, you know, roll that train backwards, as you're saying, Ben, in this, you know, time variable approach where the competencies, the ACGME, LCME competencies are are addressed, certainly. And we add this kind of growth, career, professional growth that kind of rounds out that um, that person so that we are equipping them to their best ability, as well as, you know, planting those seeds of that that kind of growth mindset, as you're talking about, and then encouraging and supporting our institutions to continue that stream, to pull that thread forward so that we can provide ongoing opportunities across the career lifespan to, um, you know, polish off that curriculum development skill set and, and get up to speed on new technologies or whatever for the teaching um, techniques. And that the, if we could build that forward, not only is it for the institutional side, good for recruiting and retention and faculty engagement and satisfaction and great patient outcomes and learner outcomes, but the faculty member, you know, ourselves, that kind of really goes a long way, as you mentioned earlier, for our not burning out and feeling valued and feeling like someone they're investing in us beyond mere, um, you know, being another cog in the wheel or another, you know, robot just doing the work, but developing us as a as a human being that I think it just makes so much sense to 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 dial that back way as as soon as we can to make sure we're ensuring a, a vibrant life workforce and life life force right I totally agree and I also think the more we empower people to have autonomy as you said toward their own development especially beyond training like I'm a faculty I'm nine years into my faculty life now and um you know, I don't always feel super supported in terms of uh, the faculty development that I receive because I'm seen as doing just fine. And it's really taken a lot of my own kind of gumption to go out and find what I need. And if we can start instilling that with people early, what kind of development are you going to need beyond training where people aren't going to be there, you know, right there supporting you with a whole program of things, especially because I think, I don't know who originally said this, but um I'll, I'll kind of give it to Jason Frank, who's a, an educator up in Canada. He always says competence is a downward escalator, which is totally true. There's good evidence that whether it's knowledge, whether it's uh, skill, any kind of thing that we learn, unless you deliberately practice it, it's going to erode. And so um, I think a lot of this time variable training where we try to empower people in this precision education and precision faculty development, where we try to empower people to think about where they need to develop most and be able to seek it out is so important because if competency is a downward escalator, we need to not only equip people with the reflective ability to say, okay, I'm going to use my performance evaluations and my performance data to see where I need to develop, but then also be okay saying, I don't think I have this skill anymore or this skill has eroded and I need to go seek it out. And right now, you know, this goes hand in hand with time-based training. Once you are credentialed to do something, you are credentialed for life in most places. I have not placed a central line as a hospitalist in eight years, and yet I am still credentialed to do so in my institution. Would you want me to put a central line in you? I wouldn't. Right. Um, and so, and so we need to have these um, programs that say, hey, it's okay that you've identified this as a gap. Maybe you shouldn't be credentialed in this anymore. So time variability is not only about attaining skills, but also losing skills and losing competencies. And then saying, if that's a skill that's still meaningful for you in your practice, here's how you can go develop that skill. Or you gain some leadership skills, but you don't use them. They get rusty. How do you get those skills back or polish up on those things? And how do you know when you've got them? Oh, uh, I think yeah. that's all part of where we need to be going. Gosh, that is so cool, Ben. I love that you just said something that I've 
kind of smacked me in the face here, gaining skills, but losing skills. Wow. I want to sit on that for a minute because I'm right back to the minimum data set in nursing homes. If you don't measure, the best way to to find out if there's no heart disease in a community XYZ is to not measure it. (laughs) If you don't measure or test for COVID in a population, by gosh, you'll probably not have it. You could say we have zero incidence of that. Yeah, because you didn't measure it. So the best way to account for changes is to measure Hence, annual assessments or his faculty members' annual reviews. But I love that you brought this up, losing skills, because, oh, gosh. Um, all right, I'm going to try to re- re- refrain from getting too, too nuts here, Ben, but you got me so excited about this. Uh, how many times in my 17 years of doing faculty development, I run across faculty members who are mid-career, late career. And that's a whole other conversation about we put a lot toward early career. But mid, like you said, People think, oh, you're fine, you're promoted, you're tenured, you're you're good. Maybe not. But they, I talk to these mid and late career faculty, faculty members. And say, I've been mentoring for decades. I'm a great mentor, and I think really, maybe not so much. Um, that's not the word on the street. You think you're a good mentor, but you're not. And it gets to what you're saying, Ben, that maybe, maybe you were then. Maybe some of those skills have degraded. Maybe you shouldn't be intubating mentees with air quotes around that. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that anymore, or You should be retraining because guess what? You've changed. Times have changed. Needs have changed. And I was listening to another YouTube about um, the generational differences. And, oh, gosh, I can't remember who it was. doesn't matter. But they're talking about the – so the boomer – the silent generation born 24 to 45, the boomer generation 1946 to 1964, the Gen Xers 1965, the millennials and the Gen Zs. And they said, like, the boomers – they're all about, they want to see you face to face. Like nothing happens unless we are human beings face to face. The Gen Xers just want to send you emails. The millennials want to text. They'll, they'll learn by texting you. And the Gen Zs, you know, will send you a TikTok video. And that makes me think of like, oh, geez, you know, I'm 58. I need to rethink my game here. Um, we need to constantly evolve our approaches. So as the my institutional hat, we as the institution need to evolve to meet the needs of learners, as well as individual faculty members need to come to some kind of a come to Jesus meeting of, yeah, maybe it's been a few minutes since I've been certified as XYZ. I need to maybe learn something new and refresh. So Ben, I love that idea of losing things and reminding ourselves that it's just the natural life course work th- things will fall apart and we need to retool and go in for that oil check and, you know, get, get the thing, the re- new roof put on the house. Right. Yep. And, and I think it takes a lot of, um, I don't know, professional humility and individual humility to admit that. I think our field has not always been great at that. We kind of put our um, attendings or our supervisors or whoever's above us on some sort of pedestal. And therefore, I think they feel as though they have to uh, have that impression management of always looking like they know what's going on and never admitting that maybe they don't know how to do something anymore. And this, the data on this from a clinical standpoint is very clear. There's actually some good data on large data sets that says um, the further out you get from training, the worse outcomes you have for your patients. And um, that's a, that's a painful thing to, it's a painful thing to accept, but, you know, and it's likely multifactorial, but it's something we have to address. But I think it even goes beyond clinical work. Like you said, I mean, let me give you an example. I- I've really tried hard to be um, a better male ally in terms of gender equity for all of my colleagues who identify as women or, or any kind of gender minority. And one of the people I've learned so much from is Dr. Jen O'Toole. She's our MedPeds program director here. She does a lot of faculty development and she runs... A, um, a, a, a nonprofit organization called Advanced PHM that is all about advancing gender equity. And there's a gender equity fellowship as part of it. I have read so many books uh, that she's recommended and gone to all these sessions and I've learned so much, but I know if I don't actively keep myself engaged in that community, that my uh, approach, my awareness, my any skills that I've developed around being a, a male ally are going to atrophy. So I think all of these skills, whether it's teaching skills, communication skills, leadership skills, uh, allyship skills, are things that we, you know, it's just like a garden. You have to water it, you have to attend to it, or it's going to wither on the vine. And time variability 
while a lot of people think about it as just trying to get to an endpoint faster because that's the novel thing, it is also about having the humility to recognize that skills come at different rates, they go away at different rates, and we have to start thinking about maintaining all of these things over time, uh, which again, as you know, probably better than others, we don't always put our resources toward and we don't always think it's okay to admit, hey, I've actually lost these skills and I I need this training. Ugh. Dr. Ben Kinnear, now you made me think of some a new metaphor, growing your garden. I love that metaphor of, especially with the time variability component of it, you don't throw some seeds in the ground and they pop up overnight. Uh, it takes time. And so for some to get promoted, that tree is going to take a long time to grow. But for um, papers and things that come quicker, more quickly, the flowers will bloom um, and the vegetables will grow. But the tree, like I'm looking using the metaphor, the tree is like the pinnacle of getting the R01, whatever. But guess what's also going to grow in that garden? Weeds. And get, guess what might also go hang out in the garden? You know, deer and little rodents are going to be eating things. So it's constantly minding the garden and having the, the patience. But I also like the humility. I love that idea of reminding us that maybe that's just never going to grow, or maybe that shouldn't have been planted with that. Or maybe now when I till that soil, I have to add something more or remove something um, that, but that takes time, right? It's, and it's hard to just standardize. Y'all can't have the same garden. That's what makes it so complicated. Yeah. And I think the humility piece, this is just, this is not empirically based. This is just my own reflections. I think it's really hard to to cultivate that humility. Uh, people who are on either end of our career spectrum, if you're a junior faculty member, you constantly feel like you have to prove yourself and therefore showing humility, showing that uh, you need help or you need growth in certain areas can be, can be harder. Some people are great at it, but, but a lot of times we still are in this performance mindset of showing what you can do, not what you need in terms of development. And I also think probably once you get far enough in your career that people put you on a pedestal or hold you up as some sort of uh, demigod of whatever is your thing, then it's also maybe hard to show humility because people have really high expectations of you. So I, I think I'm kind of in that nice sweet spot of I'm not on any pedestals and yet I'm also not an, I'm not new to the block. So I'm in a really nice spot of my career. But uh, the people I really admire most are the people who are on either end of that career trajectory, and they still show that humility and that cu curiosity. And they're not afraid to say, um, boy, I think I've I've lost this skill that I used to have, or boy, I, I found this gap and I really want to get better at it. And I, I'm lucky enough that I have so many uh, people in my life who who model that so well. I'm sure you do too. And um, you know, the question is, how do we as a profession make it easier for people? How do we make that the norm? that uh, it's just kind of expected that we actually are okay with kind of uh, intellectual humility about what we don't know and what we've what we've lost over time. So I don't know the answer to that, but that would be a great place. I think we have an answer to that, and I'm looking at the answer, and that's Dr. Benjamin Kinnear. You're part of the answer to that, is that to keep putting your voice out there, and this message is so important, and you're the way that that's going to get that we'll get around that is the next generations and that authenticity that you bring and that, you know, we in education and we who have this passion and love for development, just talk more about it and be more open and, and talk about the fact that there's an imposter phenomenon. And I still, you know, you and I, before we start, we pushed record, we were sharing our horror stories of, you know, being invited to give talks and not feeling at our top of our game and having conjunctivitis and flu and soldiering on, but still thinking, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I can do this. Am I the person for this? That I think, you know, just being honest and genuine and taking the time to me is like so much time. I always come to time because our faculty members are so pressed and so go, 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 go. And as you mentioned, it's been especially early career trying to prove that I am I have value. I'm supposed to be here. I belong here. You made a good choice by investing in me. And yes, but also then as leaders of those of us who have been been here a minute, communicating honestly and taking the time to say, listen, I see you. You're you're good. You're all right. You got this. You know, take a breath. You know, um, you're going to be just fine and we're going to work together on this. But it's people like you who will continue to to put that message out there without being the whole the old fashioned holier than thou uh, that that model is not you know 
is not going to go very far in, I think, going the future, especially with social media. I think people really were, were getting back to the authenticity of being real and we can share our stories and that kind of makes people more comfortable. I didn't think feel safe, right? Yeah, I appreciate those kind words. Mostly, I, I just feel uh, useful in terms of getting things off of high shelves because I'm so tall. I've never, ah! had, I've never had somebody say that I'm going to be instrumental in solving such a big challenge. I, I will say too, though, you know, um, you know, for people who can't see who I am, I am a middle-aged, cisgender, heterosexual white male, and and therefore, you know, I think in some ways the system makes it much easier for me to talk about humility, to try to show humility, because I don't feel the pressure of trying to represent. Uh, a group of people who have been minoritized or people have, uh, you know, even unfair expectations of. And so people who um, identify as women, people who have been minoritized by our system, I think this whole challenge is even harder oh. because uh, they may feel under the spotlight all the time and that they have to perform even above other people because, uh, you know, so I, I think there's a lot of um, complex challenges with how do we foster humility, curiosity in our field? And how do we do it in a way that's equitable? Because right now it's it certainly is not. It's it's much, much easier for again, tall white male guy like me to talk about humility and things like that because I'm not under the same pressures that some other people are just based on their identity, um, which is obviously totally unfair. Wow. So cool. And that's another reason why you're an expert. And that's another reason why you're a plenary speaker and do this really cool work. Uh, that is so, that's just awesome. That feels so good to hear you talk like that. And um, yeah, Cincinnati is really uh, very fortunate to have you. Maybe uh, maybe Hopkins can have you. Just putting a word out there, Cincinnati, hang on to your faculty members. <laughs> yeah, well, if you, like I said, if you have high shelves, I'm really good at oh, that. Yes. Um, <laughs> So there you go, Dr. Benjamin Kinnear. You having this this has been a great talk. And I think that the the lesson here is if you can do nothing, if you feel like you are at your wit's end and don't have anything to give, do what you can do easily. And that is, in Ben's case, grab something off the shelf at the grocery store for someone who is not as um blessed with vertical height. So yeah, we could do whatever we can. I love this growing your garden. I love we're not bred. This has given me so much to think about. Ben, you are, you're a wonderful, um, you're just a wonderful guest. And I really appreciate you being with us and sharing all your wisdom and your, your humor. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for having me on, Kim. What a wonderful conversation. Hello, everyone. It's your podcast producer. Just wanted to let you know that as of August 1st, 2023, this podcast that you're listening to has had over 73,000 total downloads and YouTube views from listeners in 84 different countries in the Faculty Factory website, facultyfactory.org. It has drawn over 37,000 web visits from users in 122 different countries. It's truly an international platform, and we would love to invite you you to be a guest on this show. Our host, Dr. Skorupski, makes the experience super fun, very laid back. If you want something taken out of the actual recording, I'm totally happy to do that as the podcast producer. I'll make the edit. No pressure. You're going to have fun with it. We just want to hear from different faculty around the world about their experiences. So reach out to us, facultyfactory.org slash contact us. It's the contact us page on Faculty Factory. And let us know if you'd like to be on the show. We will get you in touch with Dr. Skorupski, or you can email her directly at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.